info at samharris.org, and we will sort it out for you. Also, as you know, supporters of the show get advance notice when tickets to live events become available. This sort of thing is time sensitive. I don't know when you will be listening to this, but next week on July 19th, 2017 or thereabouts, tickets will go on sale for an event that I'm doing in New York in January with either Richard Dawkins or Lawrence Krauss and Matt Dillahunty. The organizers are still working out people's schedule. In any case, there will be an event, and I'm pretty sure it will sell out. Uh, and I'm I'm reasonably sure the good seats will sell out first. So if you are a supporter of the show and you care about getting access to tickets to an event in New York in January, and you didn't get the recent Ask Me Anything podcast email that went out with respect to AMA number eight, so you're worried that you might not be on the supporters email list, and you are hearing my voice now prior to, let's say, July 23rd, Again, please send an email to info at samharris.org and um, put in the subject line New York event, and we will make sure you get a chance to buy advance tickets the moment they come on sale. After that, everyone will see the link to tickets on my social media accounts. And I'm sure there'll still be some seats left. I think they booked a very big theater, but New York events tend to sell out pretty quickly. Also, I have another event to announce that I'm very excited about. It actually could become a series of events. I have an idea for what I'm calling the Waking Up Book Club. And the idea is that when there's an author who's bringing out a book that I really want to get behind, I will help that author launch his or her book by doing a live event and a podcast. And given the nature of publishing these events, are likely really to always happen in, in New York or Los Angeles. So this really isn't a tour idea, but it, it could be an ongoing series of events. And as a test case, I'll be doing a major event with my friend Steve Pinker in Los Angeles in March. Steve has a very important book coming out. It will be a full-on defense of the Enlightenment. And as I think all of you know, I've been wanting to get him on the podcast for a long time now. But Steve is the sort of person who just hunkers down and writes his next book, and he doesn't like to talk too much about it while he's working on it. So one has to wait for his wisdom on whatever topic fascinates him. But the book will be out on February 28th, 2018. So after he launches it on the East Coast, we will do a live event together in Los Angeles, and I will find a great theater, probably with 1,500 to 2,000 seats, and I'll probably do a VIP reception for him after the event. This is the kind of thing that, that I would feel very awkward about doing just for myself. Um, you know, other people who produce events and have me speak at them do this sort of thing. And it's one of the things that caused me to scrap the idea of doing the podcast tour. Because if I'm, if I'm producing an event just for me, I don't really feel comfortable having a reception or after party where I say, you know, only those of you who bought a very expensive ticket could come. But strangely, I have no problem at all hosting a VIP event for Steve Pinker, or really for any author I want to support. That sounds like a lot of fun, actually. And this is the sort of thing one has to do to make the economics of events like this work out. So by taking the focus off of me, I have managed to hack my own brain somehow and see a way to produce a big event that would make sense financially. And of course, soon thereafter, I will release the audio here on the podcast. Anyway, this is just a proof of concept, but if it works with Steve, perhaps I will make the Waking Up Book Club an ongoing thing. It will be at least a month or two before I have specifics to share about that event, but if you're a supporter of the podcast, you will hear about it the moment I have some information. And once again, thank you for your support of the show. You are making all of these things possible. Today I am speaking with Jeffrey West. Jeffrey is a theoretical physicist whose primary interests have been in fundamental questions of physics and biology. He's a senior fellow at Los Alamos National Laboratory and a distinguished professor at the Santa Fe Institute, where he served as president from 2005 to 2009. He's been named to Time Magazine's list of 100 most influential people in the world, 
and he is the author of the very fine book, Scale, The Universal Laws of Growth, Innovation, Sustainability, and the Pace of Life in Organisms, Cities, Economies, and Companies. And we talk about his book at length here. As you'll hear, Jeffrey is an extremely interesting guy. We ran into a few audio problems at the end, so apologies for that. All I can say is that our, our robot overlords don't yet have this internet thing fully worked out. But I, I should say that this conversation is pretty dense. I didn't really appreciate how dense it was until I re-listened to it. There's a lot of information here. Those of you who are students of physics and mathematics will absolutely love it. But some of you will find that you really need to concentrate to follow Jeffrey where he goes. And you might need to rewind from time to time or just listen to the whole thing twice. But this will repay your attention because Jeffrey is doing some very deep and interesting work, and his book is really wonderful. And now, without any further delay, I bring you Jeffrey West. I am here with Jeffrey West. Jeffrey, thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, pleasure to be here, Sam. Thank you for inviting me. You have written this fascinating book called Scale which links the, the underlying properties of complex systems to both biological and cultural phenomenon, for every, really everything from cells to cities. Yes. And it's a fascinating route into basically everything we care about. And it's, the book is, is filled with disarmingly simple-sounding questions, which <laughs> turn out not to be simple at all, but they're questions like, why do we live 100 years rather than 1,000? Why do we stop growing? We keep eating all the time, but at some point we stop growing. It's not obvious why that should be the case. Yeah. Why do people die and companies die, but cities don't seem to die? And before we get into to answering these questions, mm -hmm. first tell our listeners how you got into this, because you're a, a theoretical physicist by training, and now you're focusing on biological and even socioeconomic questions. And it seems to have been inspired both by the, the death of the Super Collider project in the U.S. and your growing sense of your own mortality. So give us the, the context of your investigations. Yes, no, thank you. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, you have pinpointed, so to speak, the uh, genesis of this in that, uh, you know, I was uh, at some stage happily doing uh, doing research into quarks and gluons and string theory and fundamental questions of physics, um, you know, dark matter and so forth. Uh, and associated that with that, of course, was this marvelous uh, project of the superconductor supercollider uh, to be built in Texas. And, uh, of course, uh, the, the vision was to open up new vistas at uh, extremely high energies and therefore at very short distances and, and confirm some of our ideas um, about fundamental forces and the fundamental constituents of nature, but also, you know, just the usual uh, search for, you know, new, new science, new physics. And, uh, and sadly, that was canned in the early 90s, and uh, I had been somewhat involved in it. Um, and... Um, uh, at the same time, I was uh, into my 50s, and it so happens that uh, I come from uh, <laughs> a line of short-lived males. Uh, very few live beyond about 60, and many die in their, have died in their 50s. I've got, I've got a similar problem. I'm just edging into my 50s, and um, I'm a, a year shy of the age my father made it to. So, yeah, I, I, I follow oh, your, your okay. Your very, well, very here. similar. Well, my father did make it to almost 61, but his father, you know, died at uh, 57, and my father's brother died at 54, and so forth. It was that. So it's a similar kind of thing. And, uh, and so I'd grown up with this idea that, um, you know, I'd probably uh, die somewhere in my early 60s. That was sort of the lifespan of what was to be expected. Uh, and in my 50s, I was began to realize that, my gosh, you know, I may only have five to 10 years at most to live. And it was the confluence of that and the death of the super collider uh, and some of the things that were being said in terms of... Um, uh, so to speak, uh, justifying why we shouldn't continue with this uh, huge project. 
that got me to start thinking about some of these big questions in biology originally. And and the the one thing that that really stimulated me and sort of got me emotionally was a statement that uh, many people are familiar with that was being banded around, especially in the early 90s, uh, was, you know, f physics was the science of the 19th and 20th centuries, whereas biology is clearly going to be the science of the 21st century. And I must say, it's sort of hard to argue with that. But uh, there was a corollary to it that was uh, sometimes uh, actually made explicit, oftentimes just implicit. And that was that, uh, you know, we know all the physics we need to know. And, uh, you know, there's no point in, uh, you know, going any further, kind of Philistine view of the intellectual ent enterprise. And uh, that really got me, uh, you know, because even though, as I said, I agreed with the first part that no doubt biology was going to be uh, significantly important during this century. Nevertheless, uh, I arrogantly and out of ignorance, frankly, sort of came back with the statement that, well, yes, that may be the case, but it won't be a real science mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, unless it starts to... Until it gets a proper case of physics envy. Exactly. <laughs> yes, something like that. Yes, to put it... Uh, <laughs> I was hesitating. Right. But um, to really, um, you know, start to incorporate the paradigm of physics in terms of it being quantitative, more analytic, based on principles, um, and therefore more predictive, uh, uh, that kind of paradigm, and also some of the techniques of physics. And the question, so the big question is, you know, to what extent can biology be mathematized and put on a kind of principled basis beyond just, in quotes, the principle of natural selection, but to put that into um, a more uh, solid foundation. That was where I was coming from before I, and I must uh, must say, I knew almost no biology at the time. But it was it was that sort of emotional reaction that got me <laughs> to start thinking uh, at some stage. Well, you know, maybe I should think about that seriously. Maybe I should actually start thinking about how you would, in fact, take this uh, fantastic set of ways of thinking and tools that we've developed uh, in physics, uh, how could you take that to biology? And that's where it coupled up with the question of aging and mortality that um, I started thinking a little bit about that. And uh, the way I framed it in my head was not just what is the mechanism of aging and why do we die, but um, to make it slightly more quantitative and say, you know, where in the hell does 100 years come from for the lifespan of a human being? You know, what is that related to? We ought to have a theory, you know. So, so to begin, put it in this kind of arrogant physics way, if biology were a, <laughs> were a serious science, <laughs> then, uh, you know, you should be able to pick up a biology textbook and there would be a chapter about aging and mortality in which there'd be a little calculation that ends up with saying lifespan of a human being should be approximately 100 years. And by the way, the lifespan of a mouse uh, should be of the order of two or three years, etc. And what I discovered as I started to take this more seriously and read not just biology textbooks, but read the literature on aging and mortality, gerontology in general, uh, was that uh, this was not a very well-developed area at that time. And in particular, as far as I could tell, no one seems to have asked the question in that form. And so I kind of, as a little exercise, so to speak, to uh, you know, spend my spare time in the evenings or on the weekends, I thought, well, maybe I should start thinking about that. How would you go about trying to show that 100 years is uh, uh, the expected lifespan of an animal our size? And uh, what that led me to, uh, first of all, was you know, if you're going to start thinking about aging mortality, uh, you have to start thinking about what is it that's going wrong in terms of what's keeping you alive. I mean, apply that to any any machine, for example. What is it that, so to speak, wears out or um, starts to become dysfunctional uh, in terms of its uh, during its lifespan? And of course, uh, you know, what's keeping you alive is metabolism. That is, you. You eat and metabolize uh, food to form energy, ATP molecules, the currency of energy. 
And um, so then I started reading uh, about metabolism and in so doing, uh, uh, discovered, I didn't discover, but I learned about uh, these amazing scaling laws, and in particular, this uh, remarkable scaling law for how metabolic rate, uh, that is the amount of energy any organism needs you know, per second or per hour to stay alive, um, how does that, how that scales with the size of an animal? And to my amazement, I uh, learned that uh, it was extremely simple and regular. Jeffrey, before before we jump into biological scaling, let, let's just answer a couple of higher level questions here because yeah, sure. I don't even think people understand what is implied by the word scaling. Yes, I was going to come to this. Absolutely. Yeah. So let, let's let's the, the big picture here is that that you point out that the phenomenon that we that really concern us that that form the space in which we live span a range of more than 30 orders of magnitude from molecules to cities. So can you, can you put that in context first? Yes, yeah, sure. So um, first of all, just take organisms. Um, uh, we go from uh, the smallest organism, which is mycoplasma. It's a, you know, a, a tiny subbacterial kind of organism, all the way up to the blue whale. That's about 20 orders of magnitude, you know, 20 powers of 10. So it's it's enormous. If you include, if you go down to molecules, you add several more orders of magnitude. And of course, if you go up to ecosystems and cities, many more. So, you know, I mean, you could even stretch this to 40 orders of magnitude in terms of the uh, structure of life. You know, all of these things are to some extent living. I mean, uh, even at the molecular level. You could uh, talk about living you know, things that are doing things that we would call life, uh, pr uh, sort of primitive viruses, but all the way up to, um, as I say, uh, a large ecosystem, and in particular, a city, which you can sort of think of for these purposes as a kind of pseudo organism. So that's kind of amazing because, um, you know, as I think I point out in the book, this is much greater scale than the relationship of us to the entire Milky Way, for example. Um, so, or or an electron to a cat. You know, these are we we, we as life span much more than that, and it's kind of amazing. And so that's that's the the range over which the phenomena I discuss in the book are discussed, but. Um, the, the phenomenon of scaling that is usually called scaling is how do the characteristics of, uh, you know, let's say, let's just be a little more uh, modest and stick to, say, just um, all mammals, for example. How do their characteristics scale as you change the size of a mammal? So mammals go from uh, the smallest, which is a shrew, which uh, sits easily on the palm of a hand. Uh, all the way up to the blue whale, which is as big as the building I'm sitting in. And that go, that covers um, approximately eight orders of magnitude in, in its mass. And uh, scaling asks the question, well, let's look at uh, characteristics of these mammals, everything from the one I mentioned earlier, metabolic rate, to something a little more mundane, like the length of the aortas. The aorta is the first tube that comes out of the heart, uh, or even you know the size of their hearts, or the length of a limb. But all these various things that you could measure, the, the, the how long they live, how many offspring they have, and so on. So that's just the concept of scaling. And the remarkable thing is that uh, when you look at any of these quantities, and uh, you know one can list maybe 50 to 75 of such uh, characteristics and ask how do they change with the size of the mammal, they all scale in that sense in a very regular fashion. And not only in a very regular fashion, but all in a similar way uh, mathematically. And uh, uh, that's extremely surprising naively at a naive level because um, you know, we, we believe in natural selection. We believe that all of these organisms have evolved by natural selection with highly contingent histories. The, each subsystem of them, each organ, each cell type, uh, each uh, genome has its own unique history. 
So you might have expected that uh, if you plotted uh, uh, any characteristics such as its metabolic rate versus size, you would get points scattered all over the graph. Um, and uh, it, quite the contrary, you find that there's a tremendous regularity that gets revealed, suggesting that underlying this extraordinary complexity, because after all, something like metabolism is maybe the most complex process in the universe, for all we know, because it, it's sort of, you know, at its most primitive level, it takes, you know, matter, stuff, and creates life. That's what we're doing, you know, as we eat and so on. You know, here's this unbelievably complex process, and yet, if you ask how it scales across this huge range of organisms, um, it scales in this very simple way. And the amazing thing is this even extends to cities that have different cultural histories and different geographies. Absolutely. So the same thing, after we did this work and explained where these scaling laws come from, it was very natural to ask the question, you know, are there other forms of life, such as, you know, more synthetic ones, so to speak, like cities or even companies, that um, express similar kinds of regular systematic scaling. And uh, as I say, f later following um, understanding the biological scaling, uh, when we looked at the data on the scaling of cities, we found um, a similar kind of scaling, similar in the sense that there was a regular systematic behavior and the mathematics was the same. The details of it are different and the details are different in a very um, important and um, powerful way. But um, it was quite similar. And, and similarly, uh, with, uh, even with companies, you know, going from a small company of a couple of hundred employees to a uh, Walmart or a General Motors, uh, there were similar kinds of scaling. So, you know, there's, there's this ubiquitous behavior that is um, quite surprising when you first meet it that says that despite you know the daunting complexity and diversity that we see out there underlying it seems to be um, a kind of simplicity which can be expressed uh, both graphically and mathematically in uh, very uh, powerful and simple terms so so maybe I should say a little bit about what the nature of that scaling yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. So Would that be helpful? Yeah, that'd be great. I would, so let's start with the case of biological scaling. And yeah. I just want you to, to go through the significance of the fact that this scaling tends to be nonlinear. It's either sublinear or yes. superlinear on your account. So what's the significance of that? Yeah, that's very important because... You know, if you ask yourself, well, look, um, if I double the size of an organism, or if I look at an organism uh, that's twice the size of another one, or in particular, let's take mammals, as I said, a mammal that's twice the size of another, then um, it contains, roughly speaking, twice as many cells, and that's linear scaling. You know, and if it's three times as big, it's, uh, it can't, contains three times as many cells, and that's roughly speaking correct. It's it's a simple linear relationship. However, the scaling of all other characteristics of an organism are nonlinear in the following sense. Take metabolic rate. If you double the size of an organism, instead of getting needing twice as much energy, twice as much food, if you like, to stay alive, um, what you discover is you don't need twice as much. You only need 75% as much, even though there are twice as many cells. And uh, this happens systematically. So if you double the size from four grams to eight grams or four kilograms to um, uh, eight kilograms, uh, it doesn't matter where you start. As long as if you double, you only need, roughly speaking, 75%, three quarters, roughly, the amount of energy. There's a 25% savings on the average every time you double. And that's called an economy of scale. That's a classic economy of scale and means, of course, that um, the, the individual cells, since you're, uh, they do scale linearly, it means that uh, the energy needed to support an individual cell is systematically smaller by this 25% rule uh, the bigger you are every time you double. 
And so, you know, your cells work less hard in a predictable way than your dogs or cats, but, uh, you know, your horse or your elephant is, are working even less hard. So uh, this is a pervasive phenomenon throughout biology, this economy of scale, and has uh, far-reaching consequences. So, it, it, and, and that similar kind of scaling gets repeated across any measurable quantity, whether it's physiological, like the one I mentioned, something sort of mundane, like the length of an aorta, or something quite sophisticated, like the rates at which oxygen diffuses across membranes or how long an organism lives and so on. And these also are governed by some, an analog to this 25% rule. So time scales uh, increase according to this 25% rule, the bigger you are. And ge ge uh, generically, the pace of life slows down. So that in fact, uh, you know, uh, if you took an elephant and you followed these scaling laws for all its physiology and all its rates of life history and scaled it according to that and just kept scaling down, uh, you would end up with a mouse. You know, a mouse is a scaled, you know, at this a tiny elephant. 18, 90 percent level is a scaled down elephant. And by the way, that brings up something that's very important about the nature of these rules, these laws. Uh, and that is that they're not like the laws of physics, which we think of as being precise, like Newton's laws or Maxwell's equations for electricity and magnetism or quantum mechanics, you know, where we have this, you know, roughly speaking, this paradigm that you can count with these principles and laws of physics, you can calculate any physics, physical phenomenon in principle to any degree of accuracy. So that uh, you know, we know the positions of all the planets at any time. Uh, we know the positions of satellites at any time. That's why we can, you know, get our <laughs> exchange messages on cell phones and so on. Our cell phones work precisely, and so forth. So all this works because the laws of physics are extremely precise, and we can calculate things and predict things in a highly precise fashion. That is not true of the kinds of laws that I'm been talking about, this kind of scaling laws I'm talking about in biology. These are laws that we technically call coarse-grained, meaning that um, they're only true to, say, 80-90% accuracy, so that um, we can predict, or you can predict from these laws, the following. So just to give you another example, if you give me the size of a mammal, I can tell you pretty much anything about it, everything from, as I said, its metabolic rate, the complete structure of its circulatory system or its respiratory system. I can tell you um, about the, uh, uh, how long it will live, how many offspring it will have, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, all these various measurable characteristics. But I can only do it to 80, 90% accuracy. And if I ask to make a prediction about a very specific elephant or a very specific mouse, I couldn't do it with, the, with anything more than that accuracy. So it's, so to speak, it's, it's for the average animal of that size. Right. Uh, but of course, that is, that's extremely powerful, not only because it connects you know, all these different organisms, seemingly look alike and live in very different environments. It connects them all under sort of one uh, umbrella and shows the, the kind of unity of life. But also it provides a baseline for asking about specific cases. You know, you can then look at specific uh, animals or specific individuals of that species and start asking questions using the scaling laws as a baseline. Mm -hmm. Well, so to talk about one variable here, lifespan. Um, so as yes. you get bigger as an animal, it, uh, perhaps we should confine this to mammals. As you get bigger, yes. you tend to live longer. And this yes. follows the scaling law that, that you, yes. this is a consequence of metabolism slowing down and economies of scale. Yes. Yeah, so the 
so this is so let me back off now and talk more generally about the origin of these scaling laws what is where in the hell do they come from for example we just talked mostly here about mammals but the same scaling laws apply to trees and plants in the following sense their metabolic rate scales in the same way as ours does that is every time you double the size of a tree in terms of its weight it uses only 75 percent more energy just like mm. we do but um for example uh the way its trunk scales the trunk of a tree scales is essentially identical to the way our aorta scales the tree is its own aorta it's all aorta it's all circulatory well, it, the system. the trunk is the aorta. Yeah, exactly. No, so so let me let me take that. Let me let me go from there. The the analog to the tree inside us is our circulatory right. system. The aorta, the analog to the aorta, which is that first tube, as I say, coming out of the heart. The analog to that is the trunk of the tree, the part that goes up before it branches into to two or three other big branches. And, and indeed, the origin of these scaling laws, because you ask yourself, you know, what is it? Uh, what is it that's common among plants, trees, mammals, birds, fish, etc., that they all seem to obey these same scaling laws, uh, even though the evol their evolved engineered design is quite different? Um, obviously, you know, we have beating hearts. Trees certainly don't have beating hearts, just to take a dramatic example. So you ask, what is it that's common among all of them? And what you realize is what's common among all of them is that they have all evolved to be hierarchical branching network systems. And you sort of understand that because, you know, just think of yourself, you're made of 10 to the 14th cells, roughly 100 trillion cells. And um, each one of those has to be serviced in some, roughly speaking, democratic and efficient fashion. And the way that problem has been solved by is by evolving these networks um, that deliver oxygen and nutrients and so on, and information from, if you like, a central reservoir down to the cellular level. And as I say, one we're very familiar with, our circuitry system, our respiratory system, our neural system, um, our renal system and and so on, and all of these have that those characteristics and the idea is that it is the mathematics and physics the sort of universal generic mathematics and physics of these network systems at all scales that are being reflected in the scaling laws and, and that was the work that uh, I got involved in, and we uh, you know it's it's uh, quite uh, complicated mathematics to work it all out. But out of that pops these remarkable scaling laws. And I want to say a couple things about the networks, because it, it's not just the networks, but they have special properties, which are roughly speaking universal. And, and one of them is that they are what we technically call space filling. It's a very simple concept. And uh, it, it's simply that uh, whatever the structure of the network, its terminal units, in our case, for example, the circulatory system, the terminal units are capillaries that feed cells. Those capillaries, so to speak, have to go everywhere because every cell in the body has to be fed by oxygen diffusing from blood from the capillaries to cells. So the endpoints of the network have to end up close by cells. Um, and so the network in that sense has to be space filling and go everywhere. Mm -hmm. As, for example, in a city, the road networks essentially have to service all buildings and ultimately all people. So, uh, um, you know, you, you, the, the, the street system uh, doesn't leave vast areas of houses without any access to them. <laughs> so it is with our bodies. Right. So that concept is called space filling, and that has to be put into some mathematical terms. And that's one of the inputs to the, or one of the constraints, I should say, on the network. I think we could introduce a mathematical concept here that will be familiar to people, but it, it seems relevant, the, the concept of a fractal, which, yes. you know, I, I think 
I mean, it seemed like in the 80s, literally everyone knew what fractals were. I mean, like the barber was telling <laughs> yes. you about the Mandelbrot set. You know, exactly. So we, we, we <laughs> had reached peak fractal back then, but I, I'm not sure the knowledge has stuck. So perhaps you could remind people about what fractals are and their significance. Yes. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me do one last thing before doing that because it relates directly to it. And that is another constraint on the network. Um, and that is that in, in some sense, the network optimizes the system. I, I say that loosely, but let me give you an example because it leads to fractals. And that is that the circulatory system that we have and that has evolved by the process of natural selection and by we have, I mean, the we I'm referring to is all mammals. That is all mammals that now exist and all mammals that have ever existed. Uh, the one that we have minimizes the amount of energy our hearts have to do to pump blood through our circulatory system to feed cells so that we can maximize the amount of energy we can devote to uh, what is called Darwinian fitness, meaning that we can devote to having sex and rearing children. Uh, and so um, uh, and that's very important. So that means that whatever the structure of the network is, not only does it have to be space filling, but its structure has to be that if we changed it in any significant way, you know, by just say doubling the, the length of the third branch of your arterial system, that would increase the amount of energy your heart has to do. And similarly, if you halved the eighth branch of your arterial system, it would increase the energy. So we sit in a kind of basin of optimization, so to speak, of minimizing the energy our hearts have to do. It seems to me that that need not be so in evolutionary terms. I mean, there's a lot, of, obviously, there's a lot about us that an engineer would not have put in place. And I, I put the, I put the prostate <laughs> yes. gland high on the list of things you would not sure. have engineered. Absolutely. That's just mathematically so at this point we can say that it's, it is optimized. Yeah, so here was the idea. The idea was that, you know, in order to start to take this idea that networks underlie the scaling laws, you have to start putting together the mathematics of the networks. And as in all physics, you need generic principles that transcend, you know, the individual system you're looking at, and you need, you know, certain assumptions. And one of the simplest assumptions was, was to assume that there was this kind of optimization, that by the continuous process, continuous feedback process inherent in natural selection, the uh, you know, mammals that have survived, uh, that we are, uh, tend towards minimization of this, you know, the amount of energy that we use to keep ourselves alive. We minimize the, the, the amount of energy that is the mundane process of remaining alive so that we can maximize the amount of energy that we put into our genes going forward. And, uh, you know, that, that, of course, need not be. On the other hand, uh, you know, if you believe in Darwinian fitness uh, and you had long enough time, which we've had, you would expect something like that to happen. But anyway, that was that was a hypothesis, and it was very natural to hook it up to traditional ideas of Darwinian fitness. But you're absolutely right. There are many aspects of our physiology, especially at my age, that you begin to realize <laughs> weren't exactly designed in the way that maybe they were optimal. But you know, you have to remember that having said that, that uh, that's always the case when you look at one individual component. You know, like you mentioned, you know, if you look at one specific thing, but you have to remember that that is interconnected with everything else. It's a systemic problem. And the optimization, and that's what part of this idea was, is not so much that it's taken place at the highly local level, and this is extremely important, but it's taken place at the systemic level. I'm talking about the systemic level of each one of these network system. So it's the entire system going from the heart and the entire uh, structure of the uh, circulatory system from your aorta downwards, feeding through tissue, uh, 
to through capillaries to cells and how that diffusion takes place, for example. All of this is one huge system, and it has to be. And the idea is that it is the systemic optimization rather than the local uh, uh, optimization. Well, I'll, I'll take your point, Jeffrey. But if you're going to argue that the prostate <laughs> gland is a masterpiece of of nature and it's God, you're going to no, have a tough time on this it is podcast. Not. <laughs> <laughs> and I certainly agree with you with that. Or the way backs are designed, exactly. for example. Yes. Or the way, I mean, I often, I still am amazed at the whole process of both uh, reproduction and uh, child and you know, delivery of fetuses into the, yeah. <laughs> into the world. Why, why does it have to be a medical emergency every time? Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, so, you know, obviously all of this. But, you know, those do not happen. My point is, they do not happen in in a vacuum. I mean, they're all interconnected, you know. And no doubt, something about that birth delivery has all kinds of other implications, not just physiological, but social implications, of course, and uh, so on. So I don't want to argue this. This is not, uh, you know, this is a secondary thing, really, to the main point uh, that. You know, when you look at these networks and you apply these underlying generic systemic principles to them, one of the things that you learn is that the optimal system is fractal like. I'll use that word. And fractal means another word for it is self similar. And, and we're all very familiar with it. Um, I'm looking out at the moment at a tree. And, uh, you know, it has this hierarchical branching network. And the fractality is expressed by the fact that if you cut some branch and remove it, it looks like a little tree. Right. And, uh, and then you can take that little tree and cut a branch of that and take it away. And it looks like an even smaller tree and so on. And that's the idea that you have this repetitive self similarity. And uh, the theory is uh, one of the things that uh, comes out of it is that there is, in fact, that the systems should be fractal in order to optimize in the way I said, and also critical, uh, fill all of space. That is, that it needs to, uh, uh, every, every part of the system needs to be serviced. By the way, I use the word fractal-like because actually the rules that evolve, that come out of the theory actually are variants of a fractal. They're, you know, to be a bit more technical about it, they're, it it's not a precise self-similar. In other words, and it's in fact true, the data shows this, that if you do take a tree and you cut a piece out of it, it does look like the tree. But if actually, if you do measurements, and the theory predicts this, it deviates in a predictable way from the original tree. But it's very close to this idea of uh, repetitive self-similarity. And one of the wonderful things that, uh, you know, you discover in all of this and that is related to the scaling laws is that all of these systems have somewhere in them some um, manifestation of this um, regularity, this fractal regularity that seems to permeate nature. And uh, some of that is uh, no doubt uh, 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 relate, related to, let's put it that way, some of it is related to this idea that something is being optimized. Yeah, so just to, to connect the self-similarity and the seemingly endless divisibility of these branching networks to the space-filling problem, just in a vivid way, this is a, this is a fact you describe in the book. So for, if you ask what the size of our lungs are, um, oh, I mean, yeah. they are about the size of a, you know, each is about the size of a football, but the, the surface area of the respiratory membranes in there is about the size of a tennis court because of just how, how yes. endlessly branching it is yes. down at the, at the smallest scale. Yeah. So it's kind of wonderful feeling that inside you is a tennis yeah. court, you know, I mean, actually. Um, and indeed, if you took your circulatory system and you laid all those, um, uh, vessels end to end. I forget the the precise answer. I think it was book. I think it was a hundred thousand hundred thousand kilometers. I believe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You go around the Earth um, certainly more than once, yeah. and uh, that's kind of amazing. You know, it's an amazing 
uh, image. It's almost, it's almost spiritual, that feeling that inside you is this unbelievable length of, uh, of tubing, but that, and that it's very systematic. You know, it's, it's, its structure uh, is obeying very simple mathematical rules that are like these kinds of rules that I mentioned earlier, these the so-called mm -hmm. power laws. There's something spooky about the, the, the power laws themselves. I mean, there's this one number to which you've alluded that runs through this that almost could put someone yes. in the mind of the, the pseudoscience of numerology. The fourth power, <laughs> yes. the fact that basically all these living systems yes. scale to the one-fourth power. Well, the one yeah. quarter, yes. The number four is the, the number that permeates all of these scaling laws. I said the three quarters for metabolic rate. It's one quarter for uh, time scales, uh, for example, mm. uh, uh, and so on. And for lengths, it's very similar. It's always one quarter comes right. in. And that's that 25% savings. Is that it's not an accident. And that's the thing that comes out of the theory based on these mathematical principles of uh, network design. And that pops out. And uh, that four, by the way, uh, if you look at the mathematics and ask where it comes from, it's it's the following. It turns out the four is is actually, so to speak, not four. It's actually three plus one, which sounds you know like a paradox. Uh, it's three plus one, meaning the the three uh, part of the three plus one comes from the uh, the fact that we live in three dimensions: uh, the up, down, and sideways. Um, and uh, the one is a reflection of the fractality of these systems. Uh, that uh, uh, it's well known among those that have st that uh, learn about fractals that they have peculiar sense of dimensions and and a fully fractal system is one that effectively adds an extra dimension. So there's this kind of weird extra dimension, and and uh, that's this one. So the four is actually three plus one. So if we lived in eight dimensions. <laughs> Uh, we would be dominant. We had life. Uh, it would be then everything would be dominated by the one ninth power, um, and we would be instead of saving um, twenty five percent, we'd be saving you know one ninth, about eleven percent. Right. I feel the temptation to remind people of just what it means to be adding a dimension here in, in fractal terms. So. I, yes. And it's a little hard to do on a podcast, but people can look up something, a figure, I think it's called the, is it the Koch curve, the K-O-C-H? Oh, yes. Um, so this, yes. this is a, yes. so you look yes. this up if you're, if you want to follow us down this rabbit hole, but there's, there's this image uh, or this, this curve, which is essentially formed by an equilateral triangle being divided on each of its sides by a smaller one-third size equilateral triangle. And you keep doing that, just adding triangles upon triangles. And you develop a kind of snowflake-looking image. And then when you ask, what's the, the size of that curve, of that figure, you know, given that in the pure mathematical space, you keep doing this infinitely, well, it's a fully self-contained object which actually has an infinite length of its circumference. Um, and this has, now this doesn't map onto the real world totally because it, we're, not, we're not talking about infinite lengths in, in terms of the, the, the world in which we live, right. but it, it, right. it, it does to a surprising degree. And, and this, Jeffrey, you could perhaps remind us of how this was first discovered, where you try to measure the, the boundary oh, yes. between two countries, <laughs> and that, be, that becomes yeah. remarkably dependent on, on basically how big a measuring stick you use. Yes, indeed. Yes, that's a, one of those marvelous discoveries that um, sort of came out of the blue and something that should have been known f since the Greeks, but wasn't. And, and it was discovered by a man named Richardson, uh, who was a uh, kind of a polymath, but he was a kind of a geographer. And uh, one of the things that he was interested in uh, was um, uh, the length of boundaries uh, between countries. And he was interested in this, by the way, because he had a theory of war that uh, somehow the, uh, the incidence of conflicts between nations was proportional to the <laughs> length of their boundaries. And by the way, we're talking about, uh, um, he, he developed that uh, around the time of the First World War. But this work on measurement came much later when he was trying to really get a quantitative hand on this, handle on this. Uh, 
and what he uh, and, and so he got hold of all these maps of various places um, and he started measuring their boundaries and one of the curious things that he first discovered was that um, I think the first one was between Spain and Portugal where he found looking at different maps very detailed maps that uh, he got completely different answers I mean I don't remember the numbers I wrote them in the book but uh, you know instead of you know one map might give um, 1100 kilometers and then um, he'd look at another map and you'd get 650 kilometers. Um, and he would look these up in various places. And indeed, he'd find different uh, uh, books recording these things, giving completely different numbers. Uh, and this was very mysterious. And he started looking around and he'd looked across many countries and he discovered the same phenomenon. And uh, he, you know, he was very puzzled by this. and. Um, he did realize what was going on, uh, but he didn't um, formalize it. Uh, uh, it was formalized later by a man named Benoit Mandelbrot, who termed the phrase fractal. And it's the following. It was that uh, the, w when people made these measurements, when, the, when you make a measurement, um, you have to have um, a ruler with a certain scale. And uh, you have a certain resolution. So you might measure, someone might measure a boundary using a resolution of only one mile. So you're measuring something that's a thousand kilometers long. Uh, you only care a resolution of a mile. But you might have someone that has a resolution of 10 miles and someone else might have a resolution of, uh, you know, I don't know, he could even be a, uh, a meter in principle. And uh, you can immediately, when you start thinking about it, you realize what the problem is, that if you measure a boundary, which is a squiggly line, and you put a ruler on it where, uh, uh, where the uh, resolution is, uh, say, 10 kilometers, then anything below 10 kilometers, you miss. But below that 10 kilometers, the line, the boundary may be squiggling around. And so you miss, you measure that as 10 kilometers. But someone else with a resolution of one kilometer would measure it as 25 kilometers, for example. So that was the problem, he realized. And in fact, then he discovered that this followed a very regular pattern, that if you plotted the length that's measured or reported versus the resolution, there was a very simple mathematical relationship. And amazingly, that relationship is just like the relationships I talked about in terms of things like metabolic rates and all the other characteristics of organisms. And that's where the connection was to fractals. And it was Benoit Mernbrot who realized that not just that there was this phenomenon of the problem of making measurements and resolution, but that, in fact, it was self-similar. Boundaries are approximately self-similar. So if you look at one scale and then scale that up, it just looks like what the boundary would look like at the bigger scale, and so on and so but forth. As you said, this, this is a genuine mystery why this wasn't discovered literally thousands yes. of years ago. I mean, this is, this is one of those things yes. that was just staring everyone in the face. And and right. most of science is not like that. I mean, this is. Does anyone understand right. why this wasn't discovered before? Really, Mandelbrot well, formalized it. Yeah. So I think first of all, I think that it was the hegemony of Euclidean geometry. Um, you know, uh, that had been so powerful, beginning with the Greeks, but it had, of course, then came down into the uh, Renaissance and then into the Enlightenment, and uh, the, of course, Newton being the great expositor uh, and using effectively Euclidean geometry. And uh, that, became, that was so powerful. I mean, the development of physics beginning in the uh, end of the 17th century, but all the way through the 18th, 19th, and certainly into the 20th century, uh, there was this, you know, we, we relied on this simple idea of Euclidean geometry, you know, this idea that a length is a length. My God, what else, you know, you measure distance between two points, that's it. <laughs> uh, and, you know, the idea that it would be depend on the resolution of your ruler that you're using or your scale that you're using, didn't, I don't think even entered anyone's mind. And um, uh, really, until 
this very practical problem of Richardson and the realization of Mandelbrot, even though uh, in the earlier, in the uh, 20th century, French mathematicians had started sort of playing around with ideas that are analogous to this, but they in no way connected it to actually, actually the measurements of uh, the people were doing. They were much more, uh, you know, they were traditionally mathematical. That is, you know, could there be anything else than Euclidean geometry kind of mm. question? Yes, well, maybe we could have this, that, and the other. But in no way did they go out and ask, let's look at the world, make measurements, and see, is it Euclidean or not? And uh, it was this kind of the, the accident, if you like, of Richardson and his extraordinary insight into seeing that there was a problem. Because I'm sure other people, I, I suspect other people had noticed this and just put it down to error or someone made a mistake and right. so on. And it was Richardson's persistence as a scientist in really, uh, you know, tracking it down and really systematizing it that led to um, uh, Mandelbrot making this extraordinary uh, observation and breakthrough mm -hmm. and introducing this concept of fractals. And, and the work that I did, in a way, was showing that, I mean, one of the, my criticisms, by the way, of Benoit, uh, whom I knew, uh, was that he, 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 you know, he loved developing this, the mathematics of fractals and he was incredibly influential and uh, insightful uh, but he didn't seem to care about why they were there what what wh where were they coming from what's the physics of fractals so to speak where and so it's very much highlights the difference between if you like a mathematician and a physicist uh, and and I would like to think that my work is explaining in this within this context of why uh, there is this fractal-like behavior in, uh, that, that is so pervasive in uh, biology. Uh, I'm not sure I saw it in your book, but it is the physical explanation born out of just the kind of the iterative process of branching and space filling? Well, no, it shows that that iterative branching in a, in a systematic way that, you know, if you relate one branch of the network to the next and therefore to the next, they obey a, a non-linear predictable relationship, a regular predictable relationship. That's what a fractal really is. Uh, that comes out of the mathematics of an analyzing these networks with constraints like the space filling and uh, the minimization of energy and so forth. Uh, and that pops out of that. Uh, and I, I, you know, it's it's highly mathematical. I I said it in the book, but it was certainly, you know, I could not give the mathematical explanation. Right, but the mathematics is being forced by a physical constraint. So so what you just said was that Benoit was fascinated by the mathematics, but he didn't really care why the mathematics were the way they were because he was not thinking as a physicist. So thinking exactly. as, a, as a physicist, exactly. what is forcing the mathematics to be what they are? Well, he was interested in the generic mathematics of fractals and what kind of curious phenomena that are associated with having a fractal space, a space that is right. fractal. I was interested in, that's, a, that, that's one kind of mathematics. I was interested and, uh, and developed the mathematics that gives rise to the dynamics of flows on these networks. Uh, and the geometry of these networks that allows these systems, these networks to go everywhere, That's uh, which is not uh, in any way a necessary aspect of a fractal. Right. But also, as I say, this dynamics of minimization. Yeah. Yeah. The only other thing I would say is that uh, from this, I mean, the, the, the thing about developing this way of asking where do the where does that fractal-like structure come from, showing that it's, it comes out of these principles uh, that then give rise to these scaling laws that we talked of earlier, then provide you with a, you know, a, a theoretical, mathematized framework for asking all sorts of other questions, such as, 
you know, uh, the question we started out with, you know, wh why do we age and why do we die kind of question. Uh, you know, also questions, you know, why do we sleep and where does eight hours of night, eight hours of sleep a night come from and so forth. These are, and so there's a whole body of work that is derivative of this uh, because there's a, a, a framework, a general framework, and you can uh, use that to apply it to many different kinds mm -hmm. of questions. Well, so I, I want to move on to the, the different kinds of questions uh, with respect to cities and other socioeconomic phenomenon. But um, I, I want to spend a moment on the question of lifespan because this is obviously of acute interest to everyone and, and is what got you into this. So maximum lifespan as it relates to scale is one where as you increase the size of, let's say, a mammal, lifespan increases. So one exception to this rule, uh, kind of a local exception, occurred to me because when you look at the lifespans of dogs, it runs the other way. Smaller dogs uh, live much longer yes, than larger dogs. Indeed. Uh, what explains that to you? Is that just a defect in, in dogs or, or what, what's happening? <laughs> no, it's not a defect in dogs. Uh, so, you know, as, as you said, um, you know, there's a scaling law for lifespan. And by the way, there's a lot of variance uh, in, in the scaling law for lifespan because um, lifespan is, you know, from this viewpoint, is a kind of uh, secondary phenomenon. And we can talk about that in a moment. Um, it's not a primary phenomenon. Uh, the primary phenomenon is, is you know, metabolism, living, and reproducing. Right. Um, so uh, there's a lot of variance. Uh, nevertheless, despite that, there is, uh, you know, the evidence is very strong for a scaling law, uh, which is increasing with this one-quarter power that we mentioned earlier. Now, um, if you just focus only on dogs, so this is, and by the way, this, these scaling laws are typically between species. They're not intra-species. Mm, right. uh, nevertheless, you could ask the question, and, and uh, I, I don't really want to go into that in any detail, but except for this question of dogs. So the important point about dogs is that um, uh, they, you know, what we call dogs, they did not evolve by natural selection. Right. <laughs> I mean, a dog evolved by natural selection, or possibly there were two, I don't know, people debate that. But, you know, there's a, one dog evolved. And then at some stage when they, just, you know, became symbiotic with us, uh, we started um, training them to do different things. And we've evolved them to, uh, you know, be small and cuddly and sit on our laps on the one hand. On the other hand, to be able to run very fast, extremely fast. Uh, and others to go down holes and hunt for things. Others to go and retrieve and so on. Others to, you know, attack and, and guard. So they've evolved with all these different characteristics uh, within being a dog. And of course, you know, that means that um, they've. Uh, you know, much more, take a greyhound, huge amounts of energy has been devoted to um, evolving that dog uh, so that it runs much faster than the original dog from which it evolved. And so uh, that means various things are given up. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's not easy, therefore, any longer to um, ask about uh, how they how things scale within dogs within the species of dog, of dog. Um, and uh, although there is a generic trend for bigger ones not living as long, although uh, there's there's tremendous variance in that uh, in in the data on that. But what is true? What is true? If you take the average dog, or if you take a dog, you know the I guess the I believe. The, what, the, the dog that evolved, you know, the original dog, <laughs> was about the size of a spaniel, you know, it was a modest sized dog, it wasn't a small dog, it wasn't a big dog. And, uh, you know, its characteristics, you know, are pretty much lie on where they should for a dog that right. size. So, a related question here in terms of the lifespan of mammals, uh, it, it is a, a funny detail that, that you discuss in your book, which is. The lifespan of a mammal, uh, humans are, are slightly off the trend line here, yes. but the general lifespan of a mammal is something like 1.5 billion heartbeats. 
They all is it, and correct. That's, that it's just quite surprising that a mouse has the same number of heartbeats in it as a as a blue <laughs> whale, uh, and we yes. get we get about two billion heartbeats. Uh, what what do you think accounts for that? The fact that we're not on the line. Okay, so um, uh, let me just uh, elaborate on that a little bit. So um, this comes out of the the theoretical framework, uh, and is strongly supported by the data, namely that heart rates decrease in a systematic way, according to these quarter power laws, and lifespan increases systematically with the quarter power scaling law. And uh, when you multiply the two things together, that is lifespan times heart rate, the increase of one, namely lifespan, is exactly canceled out by the decrease in the other, namely heart rates, so that lifespan times heart rate should be approximately the same for everybody. But lifespan times heart rate is the number of heartbeats in a mm. lifetime. So that's the thing you're right. referring to, which says this kind of amazing result that uh, even though a mouse lives two or three years and a whale could live 150 years, they would have, roughly speaking, the same number of heartbeats in their life, which is sort of amazing. So, you know, hearts of mice beat extremely fast, but they don't live very long but in such a way that the heartbeats of a whale are extremely slow and they live a long time, but that they have the same number. And that number, as you say, is about one and a half billion. Now, until about the middle of the 19th century, so until about 150 years ago, um, if you put on that graph the average lifespan of a human being, as you, that was somewhere between 35 and 40 years. That's what the expected lifespan was of a human being. Now, many, you know, some people live much longer, but of course, many died much younger. Um, and there's the whole question of infant mortality, and I don't, don't, that's, I don't want to go into detail on that. But if, you know, just taking the raw numbers, it's between 35 and 40 across the globe. If you put that into this, that fits perfectly on this number. That is, that corresponds to about one and a half billion or so heartbeats. But since then, we've, you know, since the uh, roughly the Industrial Revolution, uh, we have been through this extraordinary phase in which our lifespans have been expanding at an, at an amazing rate, so much so that now it's almost twice what it was um, 150 years ago and what it was for all human beings until uh, about 1850 or so. So, um, uh, you know, now we have uh, actually more like in the Western world, developed world, we have the equivalent to over two and a half billion life uh, heartbeats. And all of that is a reflection of urbanization and the extraordinary. Uh, social and economic and material dynamics that uh, we have brought to the planet. That is, and and it begins with um, the uh, introduction of uh, running water and sewage sewer lines. Uh, you know, roughly speaking, until about that time, until the middle to end, well, maybe beyond the middle of the nineteenth century. You know, most people didn't clean themselves. I mean, there wasn't water, and the water. No, you know, I mean, not not even the aristocracy. No, I mean, really. I mean, I, um, you know, I mean, people would go for many, many months, and sometimes possibly even years, without cleaning themselves. You know, other than maybe superficially, but not in the sense that we think of. You know, I mean, of taking baths and washing your hands and face at least once a day, and so on. And many people shower every day now and so on. But anyway, the introduction of running water, clean water, and having sewage, sort of open sewage, uh, had a profound effect on, um, on longevity. And uh, it, it started this extraordinary rise that we've seen. And of course, uh, coupled with that, with urbanization and the idea that cities, and therefore governments need to provide um, access to health and the idea of clinics and all of this, all which developed, started to develop in the 19th century. 
um, uh, and, and so therefore uh, paying much more attention to disease um, and understanding disease and ultimately the development of um, uh, you know leading up to the development of antibiotics and so on um, has led to this fantastic increase of almost a factor of two so that instead of you know being uh, being born and expecting to live to maybe 35 to 40 uh, you know, you can expect to live to close to 80 now. One question here is, what do you think the prospects are for radically extending human life? I mean, there are people like Aubrey de Grey who, oh. who <laughs> treat this as an engineering problem yes. that will one day be solved. Yep. Does your research suggest an answer one way or the other? Yeah, my research suggests the opposite. Mine is that, uh, I mean, no, it doesn't, I, I do, I, I have no problem with treating it as an engineering problem, I mean, to, as a kind of cartoon phrase. Um, but uh, I would say the following. So what I, so first of all, you cannot start thinking, at least this is my own philosophical viewpoint, thinking about extending lifespan without understanding why it is we live to the age we live, I think is already problematic for me. That is, uh, you need to, first of all, have a theory that says, look, everything else being equal, a human being should live of the order of 100 years and understand what are the parameters, what are the knobs that we can turn and twist so that we can change that. We can change it from you know 100 to 200 or whatever. So that's the first kind of philosophical point. And, uh, and that's what started me on this whole quest <laughs> and all of this work. Uh, but uh, and one of the things that I have worked on is to get a mechanistic theory for why we age, and uh, why we die, and uh, what uh, leads to this uh, hundred years as an order of magnitude for a lifespan, and to try to understand what indeed are the parameters, and uh, the to 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 make it slightly more precise, uh, what this theory um, can calculate is the maximal lifespan. What is the maximal that you could expect? And it's based on the idea of the following, um, that the very system that is keeping us alive, our metabolic system, has built into it what we call dissipative forces, for want of a better word, wear and tear, that, uh, you know, there's continual damage being done by the flow of just by the flow of blood through your circulatory system. Certainly, the blood flowing through your capillaries is, it can be quite destructive because you're, it's like pushing fluid through very thin tubes. You know, it has a great deal of resistance, and that resistance means, what resistance, physical resistance simply means is that, you know, there's a scraping between the blood and the walls of the, the cells of the, of the capillaries, and that damages them. And that damage creates entropy. That's entropy in the language of thermodynamics. And that entropy causes cellular damage. So you can calculate all that. We have a theory. You can calculate that. And that, from that calculation, you determine that lifespan should scale, maximal lifespan, to be more precise, should scale with this quarter power scaling. And it gives sort of a very rough estimate for long longevity. Now, um, that that tells you that the parameters that are um, associated with lifespan are to do with metabolism, not surprisingly, because that's keeping you alive, um, uh, and uh, that also to do with the physics, the physics of materials to do with the um, wear and tear that's occurring at the molecular level, but also, and this is crucial, um, is something that's slightly outside that. But is second in a second kind of second order way is connected to it, and that is the process of repair. That's very important, obviously, to us is that we repair yeah. damage. Um, and, and uh, but where does that repair come from? That repair also has its origins in metabolism. You have to supply metabolic energy to the repair mechanisms to um, uh, uh, forestall early death. So um, you can ask yourself, okay, <laughs> how could I extend lifespan from this picture? Well, there's two ways. One is you have to reduce damage. And the second is you have to increase repair. <laughs> that's, 
it's kind of obvious and it's like any machinery. That's why I'm very open to thinking of it as an engineering problem. So how could you minimize damage due to uh, metabolism? We said the damage came from metabolism. So one way, obviously, is to reduce your metabolic rate. Well, you, how can you reduce the metabolic rate? Well, you can eat less. Just eat less. That's called caloric restriction. And uh, caloric restriction, many experiments have been done on uh, mice in particular, and indeed caloric restriction, that is extending lifespan by feeding mice less, has by and large led to an increase in their lifespan. And many of the experiments that have been done agree with the predictions of this theory. Uh, experiments, there have been some controversial experiments in both on mice and on monkeys, which don't show such a big effect. So this yeah, is still... Yeah, I thought it didn't work in monkeys. Yeah, so this is... And there's been criticism of those experiments of various kinds. I'm not an expert, and I can't speak to that. But it's clear this is open still to uh, a lot of work, and not enough work, by the way, uh, has, is being done on it. So I, you know, it's marvelous that there are people like Aubrey and so on that are mm -hmm. thinking carefully about some of these that are different. I mean, his is focused more on mitochondria and uh, at the intramolecular well, level. As, as far as caloric restriction goes, I can tell you that it doesn't work for me. <laughs> I, I can last about a day doing it. So it's not, uh, it's not my strategy. But you may be leaving, you may be, well, that's the point. You may end up living longer, but you have to change your lifestyle. And that's then a, an individual question. You, you know, um, I, it turns out I'm very fortunate. I don't get hungry, so I can go for very long periods without eating. Whether that's, you know, I'd like if I believe my own work, that means I'm maybe going to be living longer than I would have otherwise. But do you actually pursue it as a strategy, or do you minimize? No, I do you know? not. No. And, and so, and, and what do you mean? What do you mean you don't get hungry and, and go for long periods without eating? What? What? Oh, because I don't. Uh, no, I'm just saying naturally I don't get hungry. You know, it's. It's uh, you know dinner time comes around and I don't feel hungry. So, but it's just so do you your physiological defect I have. So you're practicing <laughs> essentially intermittent fasting, but it, but so yes, how long do you go? Actually, I don't do it purposely, but it's. Uh, so I want to get get a picture of this. How long do you effortlessly go without eating before you notice you should should eat? Well, for other reasons to do with my with health issues, which is. I don't need to go into here. Um, I went for several years eating one meal a day. So I right. didn't eat breakfast or dinner uh, or lunch, and I only ate dinner. Uh, and part of that, by the way, was to do because I have some mysterious intolerance to most foods, which makes me makes it very difficult for me to work. So the way I, I dealt with that was by eating just uh, in the evenings and, uh, you know, so my days, I could be relatively clear-headed. Anyway, um, uh, I, uh, I, I could do that without very much problem. Um, and um, I did lose a huge amount of weight. Mm. I'm uh, actually, I'm about, uh, let's see, I was about 30 pounds lighter than I am now. And that began, my doctors got concerned. I didn't even realize it, actually. And then I realized that, uh, and I started to worry a bit. And then I started to get, uh, <laughs> I, I, I was get. <laughs> then comes my own personal relationship with mortality. I didn't figure I would live to more than about 65 anyway. So I decided at some stage, well, forget this. I'm going to start enjoying food more, and I'm just going to eat anyway a breakfast and lunch and dinner and forget it, uh, you know, and, and feel lousy And uh, if I do. Well, I'd also learned, by the way, to uh, work even though feeling lousy. Right. So there were a whole bunch of, you know, personal things here. That's a lesson I think we all need to learn. Well, that's probably true, actually. Uh, but anyway, let me go back to the theory, because the theory does predict this, and there's lots of data that supports it. There's this funny data on monkeys, which someone needs to repeat, and it needs to be done on other animals and so forth. So it's still an open question, but certainly this theory, which has lots of things that, uh, that it predicts are correct about aging, uh, does have this as one of its predictions. But the other thing it predicts is, as I said, you can decrease or you need to decrease your metabolic rate. Another way to decrease metabolic rate, which uh, is extremely difficult for us, 
uh, and we're un almost unique among organisms, but every other organism can do this, and that is lower its temperature. So if you lower the temperature, you lower the metabolic rate because metabolism is derived from chemical reactions, and chemical reaction theory tells you how uh, uh, that things slow down when you decrease the temperature. It's not surprisingly, temperature is the you know, as a reflection of the interaction among molecules. And if you lower the temperature, means there's less interaction among the molecules. Therefore, uh, there's uh, the metabolic rate goes down. And it goes down exponentially. So, so a small change in temperature produces a large change in uh, chemical reaction rates, and therefore a large change in metabolic rate. And you can predict what this is. And there, there are lots of, of data on uh, animal, um, uh, ec what's called ectotherms, um, animals that uh, are cold-blooded, which is the vast, you know, almost all, all organisms are. And the theory fits beautifully, the data, uh, or the data, I should, maybe I should turn it the other way around. The data beautifully confirms the prediction. <laughs> and so that's very nice. Uh, However, that's very difficult for us, although there have been experiments uh, on mice, again, where they've in introduced drugs that lower body temperature, and the claim there is that it does increase longevity. So there's lots of evidence, uh, I would say, supporting evidence that uh, decreasing metabolism uh, increases lifespan, and, uh, you know, that brings up uh, you know, a similar issue that you mentioned about caloric restriction. You know, there are drugs, apparently, since they've used them on mice, that would lower body temperature and uh, and therefore low metabolism, lower metabolism. But goodness knows what other unintended consequences that has, um, and, and including just the lowering of metabolism itself. Uh, you know, do we want to live long and be couch potatoes? Uh, you know, no, we don't. We want to have kind of, you know, a healthy, lively, uh, passionate life right to the end. Uh, you just sort of want to extend it for the sake of extending it. So there's all kinds of social and personal issues that, that come up. Now, the other way of extending lifespan is um, to increase repair mechanism. You know, and that's uh, related sort of to qu these questions of telomere lengths and so forth. But, you know, one could imagine um, a genetic in intervention to increase uh, uh, repair mechanisms. And, uh, you know, there are animals that have, uh, um, you know, special repair mechanisms that we don't have, ones that, for example, attack specific tumors, as an example, and so forth. Uh, and uh, one could imagine this is kind of scary stuff in a way, and it's, uh, you know, re would require um, great care as to the unintended consequences of doing something like that. Uh, but, you know, that's what people, many people are thinking about. Uh, uh, but it also brings up this other issue that I brought up a moment ago, um, which is, yes, you may, even if you do this and you minimize the unintended consequences, one of the other unintended consequences may be that you're allocating now so much more energy to repair than you would do naturally that, uh, you know, you're tired and exhausted all the time. Uh, so again, it's a lifestyle question. And so all these are, you know, issues that uh, we need to think about very, very carefully. Uh, on the question of tumors, doesn't scale have some implication here? Because yes. mice get many more tumors and, and yes. whales apparently get none, or at least we, we haven't found cancer in, in things like blue whales. Yes, they don't get them. So this is again, so uh, that brings up, you know, I mean, you can apply this these ideas to cancer. And you could argue again that cancer many tumors are triggered by damage from metabolism, and many are, and maybe even most of them are, uh, come from damage problems. And uh, you can, from that, uh, derive, uh, first of all, you can understand the tumors independently of that. That is, you can understand the metabolism of the tumor itself and of its vasculature, you know, or how it's being supported by the host, namely us. 
and uh, these are v these are potentially very important for uh, developing uh, therapeutic interventions. But um, uh, one of the more interesting things is that uh, you know, as far as we can tell, roughly speaking, the lifetime number of tumors is roughly the same, independent of the size of the mammal. So you know, so this does bring up the question: if mice get many more tumors than we do, and all the experiments we're doing on mice uh, uh, concerning cancer, uh, you know, we need to understand that. We need to understand why this is so before we extrapolate uh, um, experiments and interventions on mice to human beings. So this is, a, an, again, a, an area which requires much more detailed research as well as developing this big picture. Okay, so I, I want to plunge into the socioeconomic phenomenon like cities. But before we go there, I want to ask you about the concept of emergence, because when, when we're talking about yes. complex systems, we're often talking about so-called emergent phenomenon or emergent properties. Indeed. And this is, I mean, this extends, you know, across the board to everything from consciousness or minds generally to things like economic systems. This, this is often, the, the concept of emergence is often put forward as a kind of embarrassment to reductionism. It's, <laughs> it's often said that you, you just can't understand consciousness or minds or economic systems in terms of their constituent atoms, right? We'll never understand the, the difference between a totalitarian society and a free one in terms of particle physics. <laughs> and I've often been a little skeptical of, of what is being claimed here. And so I, I, and since you are, you, since complexity is really your wheelhouse, <laughs> I, want, I want to get your thoughts on this. But I, to, to sketch this out a little bit more so that our listeners understand my concerns, the idea is that we're urged to acknowledge that, that reality at every level has a description that's appropriate to it, and therefore you can't reduce everything to physics. And I, I've long wondered whether this is a bit of a dodge, because, for instance, if you take something like the mind, if you believe, as many, certainly most, neuroscientists do, that the mind is simply what the brain is doing, and everything the brain is doing is, at bottom, a matter of moment-to-moment -moment changes in its neurophysiology, well, then it, it might be true to say that well, it'll never be convenient to talk about something like your appreciation of Shakespeare in terms of neurotransmitters. But it, it, it would also be just true that every instance of appreciating Shakespeare just is a neurophysiological event. And it's, it, it's realized or not at this basic level. And so the lower level really would still be primary. There would be no downward causation. There's, it's not that there's a mind that is an emergent property of the brain that is acting on the brain. There's, there are simply states of the brain, each following the next. And so I'm wondering if you can think of an example where there is a higher level phenomenon that truly has causal powers as a higher level phenomenon that are not reducible at some point to the causal powers of its constituents, of, of the lower level phenomenon. Yeah, well, this is, of course, an ongoing discussion uh, and uh, is um, especially in the area you brought up um, in in dealing with mind and brain and so forth. But uh, I've sort of uh, come. I, I'm sort of uh, more along your lines uh, is my thinking, uh, and uh, less along the lines that um, there's something completely new emerges. Um, because, uh, you know, let's, let's take something that is presumably a little simpler than, a, uh, than the brain and mind problem, uh, and one that I have thought about some, and that is um, the city, you know, which we'll probably talk about a little bit. But a city is, you know, the idea of emergence, uh, where I do like the concept, is that, you know, a city is not the sum of all the people in it. And it's not the sum of all the roads and all the buildings. Um, it's not um, the sum of all the events that take place in it. There's something, you know, much more than that. And, uh, you know, it's some integration of all those. Uh, and, uh, and it's useful as a concept uh, to think of it as uh, uh, some collective phenomenon. Uh, 
uh, and and talk about its own individuality. And we do, obviously, talk about New York or San Francisco uh, and, and so on. So it has a, uh, you know, it does have a sense of individuality. But obviously, it is the sum of, uh, you know, it is, it, it, it is derivative of all of these individual components. Uh, I don't think anyone would deny that. That is clearly true. Uh, and I would say the, the kind of in-between road I take is that, yes, in principle, you could imagine that um, uh, the city is uh, the, the sum of all the multidimensional variables of which it is uh, composed. So there's, you know, uh, it's not just 10 million citizens that live in a given city and uh, the length of all the roads and all that. But it's some integration of all that, and that each one could be, you know, pinpointed as a variable. And each one you could imagine um, has some dynamic associated with it in terms of its interaction with everything else. And so you come to this uh, this concept, which is the concept really that is inherent in the the idea of complexity and complex systems. That yes, it is made of constituents, but um, you know if we start to delineate them, it, um, it's it's almost an infinite number, and associated with them is an infinite number of equations, and of course that means that it's you you can't come to terms with that. I mean that's not a that's not even becomes then conceptually not a soluble way a soluble problem, and a way of deriving what the dynamic of a city is, whether it's organization or growth or structure. Yeah, well, I, I get the way complexity limits our ability to forecast or, or even describe. But my question is really whether higher level phenomenon ever have causal powers that are not simply a matter of their of lower level phenomenon having causal powers. Almost the simplest possible example comes to mind here where imagine two stones and you have one stone that is spherical and one, one stone that's shaped like a cube, and you put them on the side of, of a hill or an inclined plane. Now, the sphere will roll down the plane, and the cube won't. You could argue that its higher-level property of being spherical allows one system of atoms to behave totally differently than another. But right. even in that case, is this really... Downward causation is isn't this still really a matter of what the individual <laughs> atoms are doing in uh, concert with the uh, other individual atoms of the plane? Yes, I mean, of course, ultimately it is. But I, I do go back to that. It's not a it's 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 not a useful. In fact, I would even say, thinking of that problem, it's a useless description. It's not. It doesn't help us, you know, in describing that motion. Right. I mean. If you wrote down the equations for every atom in the uh, cubic block and every atom for the spherical block, um, uh, you know, there's, there's no way, there's no in, in a finite time to determine what the motion is. So in that sense, it's a, it, to me, it's a moot question. You know, it's like, uh, you know, much more useful to have the concept of... Um, uh, you know, of, of this collective that you call the stone that has a certain shape, give it that geometry, that macroscopic shape, and it's, you know, which is determined by its, you know, ultimately by its construction of its, mo you know, the molecules and their interaction. That gives rise to the shape and then move to that next level, that, that higher level of uh, uh, where it's, um, where the sphericity uh, plays a critical role. I mean, there's no question that we that we need to talk about geometry and Shakespeare and mental states in terms other than solving endless equations for individual atoms. You'll get no dispute from me there. This this concept of emergence is often sold to us as again this a kind of downward causation issue, which, yes. which it has always seemed a little spooky uh -huh. to me. And I I wanted to see if if you could perform an exorcism yes. on my doubts or, or share them? Well, I, I don't like very often, I do like the concept of emergence because it's a very useful concept for thinking about many problems. Uh, you know, the, the, 
that there that there is a collective phenomenon that it, it goes beyond just the uh, individual constituents. And part of this is semantic because it depends what you call constituents. You know, I mean, uh, as I said about a city, often one thinks when you think of a city in a certain way, you think it's constituents of people. Uh, another way, you might think of it as the buildings and so on. So one well, has to be careful. And I think that's true of the brain as well. After all, one of the amazing things about thinking about the brain is almost no one talks about the fact that all those neurons have to be supported by a, an energy system. Going back to what we were talking about earlier, it has to be metabolized. So integrated with that um, neural system, which is doing all the firing and which is presumably the origin of our consciousness and mind, along with that, is all of this extraordinary dynamics of the circuitry system feeding it. And it has to do it in a highly integrated uh, way, highly local in space and time. Now, you know, when we think of the constituents of the brain, we don't talk about those. We don't think about the capillaries of, uh, of the circuitry system, of which there are as many, if not more, than there are neurons. So, um, you know, and, and the brain and our mind is, in that sense, to use that language, you know, is an emergent phenomenon coming from, uh, you know, not just uh, all those neurons or that, that white matter and gray matter uh, uh, and the electrical firings, but also of the support system and the whole infrastructure that is uh, giving rise to this. So. You know, it's a, it's, it's, one has to be very careful, I think, in um, the way one uses this language. I do not, I don't use it at all in a technical way. And I think it is, and I only use it uh, in a descriptive way. I think it's good for narrative and it's good for description. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, I'm very loath, as, as the word complexity, right. by the way, I have a similar feelings about complexity. You know, they're useful words, but, you know, I think one should be careful about taking them too seriously. Uh, and I, and so it's, it's a, you know, it's a bit of a cop-out, I must admit. Well, no, it, it actually, it's, it's one of those cop-outs that jives with my intuition. So it's, it's one that I uh, like, you know, yeah. in, in, the, in the spirit of confirmation <laughs> okay. bias. Good. Uh, thank you for enabling yeah. me. We're going to move recklessly from brains to cities, but there's obviously there's a connection here. I mean, you almost describe cities as a almost like a, a fractal adumbration of the the fractal structure of the brain. And much of what you say about cities, there's a note you sound at various points in the book where it's almost that the question is whether civilization will fail, right? I mean, what what is the future of this whole project? Yeah, and right. It has more than a little to do with the future of cities. And, and one th I'll, I'll just set this up by pointing out a few things you say here. I mean, one, one thing you point out is that, that cities are, are very hard to kill. They tend to survive even if you drop a, a nuclear bomb on them, as we discovered. And whereas companies die and obviously organisms die, companies die to a degree that is, will surprise some people. I think you say that half of all publicly traded companies disappear within 10 years of entering the market, which I found astonishing. I, I did too, by the way, when we did, when we did yeah, the analysis. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> and here we're talking about publicly traded companies. We're not talking about all companies. Yes, publicly traded, already on the stock exchange. So why do cities matter? And what, and what do you, how do you view the future of innovation and the survival of civilization through the lens of, oh. of cities? <laughs> Yeah, this is, a, of course, yeah, good, a... Good luck with that. <laughs> we could spend as much time on yeah. this as we have on the rest of it. Uh, um, and indeed, this is where uh, my passion is at the moment. But uh, I'm really pleased that you brought up, by the way, this uh, connection between cities and brains, because one of the things that, uh, you know, one of the things that distinguishes cities from organisms is that uh, cities integrate in, in, uh, you know, in, in real time, so to speak, both the infrastructure, uh, uh, you know, the, which is very much like biology, you know, the roads and the transport systems in general, and 
you know, uh, gas lines and water lines and electrical lines and so on. So that's very much like the way we were sort of talking about biology. But they have this other piece, which really isn't um, uh, usually a part of, uh, of, of an organism. And that is the interaction between its, <laughs> going back, its constituents, if you like, <laughs> namely the, the uh, social network structure that is implicit in cities and uh, which, uh, you know, is us talking about what, what we're doing now, except we don't happen to be in the same city, but, you know, interacting with each other and forming groups and, um, you know, modular parts of networks and so on, uh, which we, which is, uh, led ultimately to the extraordinary socioeconomic system and quality of life and standard of living to which uh, we're privileged. And um, that is something that doesn't exist in biology. And the kind of structure of the networks that underlie that dynamic, our social networks, are very similar in their mathematics. Namely, they are fractal-like. They have this fractal kind of quality to them in terms of our social organization. But uh, uh, they also have um, uh, another part that's uh, quite different, and that is instead of an economy of scale, meaning the bigger you are, the less per capita, these networks induce uh, th something that is the opposite behavior. The bigger you are, the more per capita. And you can sort of see that in terms of, you know, um, I talk to you, you talk to a friend of yours, uh, he talks to someone else, and then they talk to me and we all get together. And we have this sort of positive feedback mechanism, ideas develop, um, uh, conversations have a kind of progression. And ultimately, that dynamic, which is formalized in terms of our, uh, you know, our commerce and our business and our economies and our finance, but also in terms of our universities and educational institutions, that phenomenon of positive feedback of people interacting with each other is something that uh, you know we discovered um, only extremely recently, only in the last few thousand years, and uh, especially when we started, when we evolved from being hunter gatherers to forming sedentary communities and ultimately cities. Uh, that is the origin of our huge difference and enormous success if you you know in terms of uh, socioeconomic uh, values so uh, and there's nothing like it in biology and that is you know what has led to this uh, you know the 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 phenomena of wealth creation the phenomena of innovation and the phenomenon of um, ideas idea creation the nonlinearity does cut both ways here because you get more of the wealth, but you also get more of the crime and the influenza. And Absolutely. So the thing that uh, is uh, fantastic about cities, and cities are the engine, by the way, you asked earlier, cities are the engine that we invented for facilitating and enhancing that social interaction. And uh, that's why... You know, more wealth is created in cities, ideas are created in cities, innovation takes place in cities. Um, and that's where the buzz and the activity is, the kind of feeling of a sexy life in a city, you know, with more opportunities, more restaurants. All of this is coming from this positive feedback mechanism. Uh, and uh, But it has the consequence that it's all socioeconomic activity, which means the good, bad, and the ugly come together. So whereas you might get a higher wage in a city, you might have more social interactions in a city, more access to culture, uh, more museums, restaurants, and all the rest of it, you also get uh, greater access, to, <laughs> sadly, to uh, more crime, uh, more pollution, more disease, and so forth. So, uh, and, and the amazing thing I think that we discovered was that all of these socioeconomic activities that I just mentioned all come along to the same degree. That is, the scaling of cities uh, between themselves uh, in terms of these characteristics and metrics, as I say, everything from uh, wages to the number of AIDS cases to the length of the roads uh, and so on, all of these scale effectively in the same way 
um, to each other effectively, and in the same way across the globe, whether you look in the United States, European countries, Japan, China, uh, Latin America, and so on. So there's a kind of extraordinary universality to cities underlying their extraordinary diversity and complexity, mimicking the extraordinary simplicity in the scaling laws underlying the uh, diversity and complexity of organisms. Also, we, we should say that the pace with which we are adding cities to the globe, or which people are, are, are adding oh. themselves to cities and growing the cities in size, is astonishing. It's something like uh, a city of 1.5 million ha has to be created every week, which gives us a, a, a new New York metropolitan area of, of 15 million people every two months or so. That's correct. And, uh, you know, if you just average the numbers from now to mid-century, that's roughly what it says. And that is phenomenal. So uh, I often say, you know, many people are very familiar with the idea that we live in an, ex uh, you know, an expanding universe, you know, the, from the Big Bang. Uh, uh, but many people don't somehow, even though they live it and they're part of it, don't realize that we're living in an exponentially expanding socioeconomic universe and it's manifested in uh you know these these, these kinds of numbers that uh, and you know and another number is that you know china is going to be building uh two to three hundred new cities in the next 15 or 20 years each in excess of a million people because it has to urbanize several hundred million people in the next uh in the in the relatively near future so you know this is an astonishing rate uh, and you realize two to three hundred new cities of a million each, that means creating the urban structure of the United States in China in the next 15 to 20 years. That is, now, whether they can do that or not, I don't know, but uh, that's what they talk about. But the effect that it's going to have in terms of the pressure on the rest of us in terms of uh, access to energy, to resources, to things like water, and rare metals uh, to, uh, you know, and, and, and the stress on the social fabric. Although, although paradoxically, you, you make this point that cities are actually greener than smaller towns. I mean, if, if, if you're an environmentalist, you should yes. live in New York, right? <laughs> yes. No, this is, it is, so this is a curious thing. It's something I didn't mention, but we sort of skipped over it. So even though cities scale the same way uh, across the globe, first of all, they scale differently than biology. They scale with the same mathematics these simple power laws, but instead of a 25% savings on infrastructure, as we see in biology, in cities, we get a 15% savings. So instead of a three quarters scaling, we get a 0.85 roughly. So there's a 15% savings. But uh, and that's an economy of scale in terms of infrastructure. You need less gas stations per capita, the bigger the city governed by this 15% rule. But on the socioeconomic side, we see a 15% increase of everything. So those things that I talked about were that, um, you know, uh, wages and AIDS cases and roads and electrical lines and educational institutions all increased by about 15% above just doubling uh, every time you double the size of a city. So uh, that's uh, what we call superlinear scaling, as distinct from the sublinear scaling of the infrastructure. Now to your observation, your question about the, uh, the carbon footprint. If you have, uh, you know, as you increase size, you have 15% less infrastructure, uh, and in particular, 15% less transport, so to speak, is needed. Uh, then that means that you have, um, uh, roughly speaking, you might expect 15% uh, less of uh, carbon emissions, for example. Well, it's not quite 15%, but there's def there is a definite trend that the bigger you are in terms of a city, the less carbon footprint per capita there is from the individual. So New York is, in fact, uh, the, the greenest city in the United States. And I live in Santa Fe, which is a city of, you know, of the order of 100,000 people. It's, of course, one of the most uh, profligate in terms of its carbon footprint, even though, you know, it has a much more idyllic feeling to it uh, in terms of, you know, one's image than, say, New York does. 
So this, these are very important things that we need to understand. Okay, so in the last few minutes, Jeffrey, I want you to plunge us either into uh, feelings of doom and gloom or our brightest hopes. And it, it's focused on this question of innovation, yeah. because you, you really paint the imperative of innovation. There's really a choice between innovation right. and, and catastrophe on your account. And that, and innovation has to keep <laughs> accelerating. And yeah. it, it, I get this image now, when I think about this, of civilization being this Ponzi scheme that just has to keep going or it all collapses. What is the burden of innovation as it is currently felt? And, and what are the prospects that we will keep innovating at a pace sufficient to um, get us uh, to uh, kind of have a, a durable civilization? So one of the things we didn't talk about in biology was growth. And one of the things that comes out of the theory is that you can understand growth and understand growth curves. That is, how does the size of a system, the size of an organism such as us, change uh, you know, with time? Uh, how do we grow? And uh, one of the satisfying things about the theory is that it predicts um, very nicely growth curves. That is, that you grow quickly and you stop growing. And it explains why it is that you stop growing. Um, and uh, it's the, the, the theory applies to any organism, and it's quite universal. It only has two or three parameters in it, and it can explain the growth of any organism, so much so that uh, the theory tells you how to rescale any, all organisms so it appears that they all grow in the same way and at the same rate. So it's, it's, a, very, um, it's a very nice package. And, but one of the most important things that comes out of this is that the reason that you stop growing, or organisms stop growing, is intimately related to the sublinear nature of these quarter power scaling laws, that you have economies of scale lead to uh, um, uh, the cessation of growth. So it turns out in biology, you can summarize all of that stuff, all derived from the network theory, that um, uh, organisms grow in this way that leads to a stable configuration. They stop growing. Uh, as they get bigger, as organisms, the bigger an organism is, the slower its pace of life. Everything slows down and it lives longer. Um, and um, it ultimately dies. So all of that can be, comes out of this uh, generic uh, network theory. Now, in biology, and I'm sorry, in, uh, in cities and, uh, in particular, instead of having um, this sublinear scaling, you have, in terms of its socioeconomic dynamic, we have this superlinear scaling. And um, if you then ask how does that feed into the growth of a city using the same kinds of ideas, you discover that the city would uh, can grow indefinitely. It has this open-ended growth, which is fantastic because uh, it's very consistent. That's what we see. Most cities, uh, you know, traditionally cities have just kept growing and the socioeconomic enterprise has kept growing with them. Um, and that is intimately related to its superlinear behavior. The other thing that comes along with superlinear behavior is that, again, in contradistinction to biology, the pace of life increases, increases with size rather than decreases. So life gets faster the bigger you are. Life in New York is quantitatively and predictively faster than it is in a place like Santa Fe. People walk faster, transactions take place faster, and so on. So, uh, but you have this kind of open-ended growth. So it's very nice and it's, uh, it's, it's very satisfying, except it has built into it a kind of fatal flaw, if you like. And technically, mathematically, that's called a finite time singularity. And uh, what that means in English is that uh, in some finite time, it could be five, 10 years, 100 years in the future, whatever the metric is that you're looking at, whose growth you're looking at, and it could be you know, the GDP of the city, it could be uh, the number of restaurants in the city, it could be the number of AIDS cases in the city, will become infinite, which is completely nuts. So, uh, and, and the theory tells you what happens. It says, 
that uh, the theory, the uh, system stagnates and then collapses. That leads to its death. Um, so it's kind of a fancy version of Malthus in a way, to be honest. It's a, a sort of neo-Malthusian argument, but uh, wrapped up in some fancy mathematics. Except, except in the city with an infinite number of restaurants. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So uh, the question is, how do you get out of it? And this is where innovation comes in. Because you realize that, uh, you know, when you talk about this growth and uh, you talk about these scaling laws, it's all within a given paradigm, a given innovative paradigm, such as um, one has, um, you know, we've, in, we've discovered iron or we've discovered coal or uh, we've invented computers or we've uh, discovered IT something um, of that magnitude, which sort of um, has a almost universal cultural implication, as well as socioeconomic implication. And uh, it, it effectively resets the clock. It's a paradigm shift where the system effectively starts over again. So the way you avoid um, this stagnation and collapse is that somewhere before you reach the singularity, you have to make a major innovation, uh, which resets the clock and you start over again. Now, of course, when you start over again, once again, you all hit a uh, finite time singularity in principle. So you have to innovate again uh, before that to reset the clock and, so to speak, reinvent yourself. So uh, there's a sort of little theorem, so to speak, that you can uh, uh, that, that uh, comes out of this, and that is that if you demand continuous open-ended growth, then you have to have continuous innovation cycles. Well, that's not, uh, you know, that's sort of been talked about a lot. But the catch to this is not only does the pace of life have to be continually speeding up as you grow, but the time between innovations has to get shorter and shorter so that you have to accelerate this rate at which you're innovating. So uh, to put it in cartoon terms, it might have taken you 100 years to develop an idea uh, 1,000 years ago. Now it only takes 25 years because of this positive feedback mechanism that's coming from it built into the social network that speeds everything up, gives rise to superlinear scaling, and demands that uh, for uh, the, the system to remain open-ended and viable, you need to be uh, have accelerating innovation. So, you know, that brings up a whole bunch of questions. I mean, uh, you know, so it says that, uh, you know, we just had the, it took us maybe 25 years to go from, you know, computers, laptops to uh, IT. Uh, you know, we're going to have to make another major innovation in maybe 20 years. Uh, to something that will have as big an impact. And then, you know, in uh, less than 20 years after that, you're going to have to have another one and so on and so forth. And you can make a kind of reductio ad absurdum argument that eventually you're going to have to be making a major innovation, revolutionary innovation paradigm shift um, every year or every six months and so on. It's obviously crazy. So uh, something quite dramatic has to change in, in, in this dynamic for us to avoid this. And uh, so what we see is that the mantra, the traditional mantra, particularly economists and others, that, uh, you know, all of the problems we face, well, don't worry about them because we're going to innovate our way out of them. Well, to some extent, that is certainly true. Uh, but in another way, when you look at it through this lens, what you see is that those innovations are simply postponing the big problem. And uh, so uh, the question is, you know, how do we get out of it? And, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that I have been thinking about is that, um, you know, mostly when we think of innovation, we think of it in terms of physical, technological kinds of terms, you know, all the ones that we've mentioned and all the ones that tr traditionally talked about. Maybe we need to define what we mean by an innovation or a paradigm shift um, and or what we mean by growth. And um, so just in terms of growth, 
the growth has, uh, you know, is traditionally measured by uh, physical kind of quantities, uh, and in particular economic quantities, and uh, like the GDP. And uh, maybe we should start thinking about uh, introducing uh, uh, real metrics for um, you know quality of life and um, happiness and contentment. I mean, this is a bit of a platitude, but uh, people have, have, of course, started thinking about it. But maybe we should take that quite seriously um, and think in different terms. And that's associated with um, education as a uh, technical innovation and rather as a cultural or social innovation. Um, that uh, something, you know, because as I was saying earlier, underlying all of this dynamic is the dynamic of uh, dynamics built into social networks, the continuous positive feedback that uh, is part of who we are in terms of our communities and our collective behavior. And, uh, you know, that's, that's who, that we cannot change and don't want to change. Uh, but maybe we, that if we could have a cultural shift where that gets channeled into a different way of thinking or a different way of dealing with our um, uh, external reality, uh, maybe that's a way out. And, um, you know, that's huge. That's, that's truly revolutionary. And uh, just to, <laughs> does that say, Jeffrey, are you suggesting that much of what is material will become virtual? I mean, how do we actually uh, you no, know, escape know. entropy here? Or, or uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, maybe it would be virtual. Maybe it would be, uh, you know, just a, a way of being in terms of, um, you know, uh, our, the kinds of desires that we have. Uh, you know the so actually uh, sim of, simpler lives. Yes, because yeah. part of uh, of the of the dynamic is clearly um, a manifestation of greed, for want of a better word, and that's not, and I don't mean that necessarily pejoratively. Just that we want more. You know, we want we want to have um, uh, you know uh, you know more than you know more more cars than we need or more um, IT than we need. Um, you know, I mean, I'm going to have to buckle down soon, no doubt. I get an iPhone 7 or whatever, you know, I mean, but there's that, that treadmill effect. And the question is, you know, can we attain that in some way and channel some of that energy into um, social phenomena and cultural phenomena and still have a vibrant and, and have growth in that, but still, but have a, a vibrant kind of socioeconomic society with wealth creation and um, innovation without this need for continuous, uh, almost mindless growth. I mean, that's the paradigm we invented. It's been unbelievably successful. I mean, it's extraordinary. And uh, we want to save as much of it as we can, but it has seems to have built in it some potentially fatal flaws. So that's the that's uh, you know the the issue and and i must say i you know i don't know i've not thought this through carefully and many of the ideas are still very fuzzy uh and in fact i i refrained from thinking too much about it because i thought it requires a truly revolutionary change um and uh, that's going to be impossible and then uh, amazingly the trump phenomenon has made me rethink it because, um, you know, whatever Mr. Trump is, one of the things that he has uh, induced is the potential of a paradigm shift. Um, you know, I, a paradigm shift I don't like. Uh, namely that, um, you know, up to now, our socioeconomic system, and particularly our political system, relies on a certain um, degree of rationality, a certain degree of... Um, trust a certain degree of um, believing in facts, believing in science, uh, believing in rational argument. And uh, suddenly along comes this person uh, in a leadership position, a very powerful position, who has violated a lot of that. And, uh, you know, under what we, what I would have thought is normal conditions, you know, this man wouldn't last five minutes. 
quite the contrary, at least half of the nation doesn't seem to care. And, uh, you know, they've gone from sort of uh, <laughs> being part of an old system to just saying, well, it doesn't matter. This is fine. We can make things along, make things up as we go along. We don't have to be consistent. Um, we don't have to pay attention to all the facts or to any facts, maybe. Um, you know, that seems to be what is developing. And, uh, you know, it's hard to see society running that way. But that if that is sustained for the next several years, that is a paradigm shift because what's going to happen is that everybody will start behaving like this, so to speak. So this is what the kind of speculative thoughts I've had. And uh, whereas, you know, I abhor what is happening uh, because it violates many of the things that I believe in and that many of us believe in, nevertheless, the fact that, you know, 150 million people, apparently, or whatever it is, uh, have just gone along with it means that you can actually have a major paradigm shift culturally and socially. And so maybe we could do that but in ways that would solve this problem, be much more positive, uh, you know, where we do believe in science, believe in all those things, and indeed believe that we can have a new kind of life where, you know, uh, our ideas of uh, success and contentment are not primarily linked or only linked, maybe that's the way of saying it, only linked to material well-being, that there are other uh, dimensions and other metrics that uh, might be so might might uh, you know that we might all uh, agree to so you know this is speculative it's a bit flaky but uh, it's something that uh, uh, but we do need to come to terms with this question of being on this accelerating treadmill of innovation mm. well listen jeffrey I, I i don't think i've ever seen someone find such a Surprising silver lining in in the, in this mass psychosis uh, right. that we we have witnessed politically, but I you know I I think it's it's, it's actually it's, it's a fascinating point. I, I think before I follow you into a a future of neo ludditeism where we are perfectly content as contemplative monastics, I'm going to need a little more IT given the pains we suffered at the end of this interview trying to get exactly. linked up. The question is. Can we have our cake and eat it too? We don't want to be adites, so, you know. That's but so I don't want to be sort of uh, proposing any kind of luddite solution. Quite the contrary, I think we, you know, the question is: is there a way of, so to speak, uh, threading the needle here that uh, we can have, uh, as I say, have our cake and eat it too in some way? Yeah, no, I I, I totally take your point. I, I, I think the future is some hybrid, uh, or, or the the sustainable future is some hybrid of super high tech perfection of IT and and whatever can be virtual should be virtual and a greater ethical and intellectual norm of simplicity in some sense simplicity yeah. of, of attention and 